Presented by RomulusIT.com, offering remote support for common computer problems. Landry.audio, listen, like, and subscribe. Today, we're speaking with Mike Chapman, an author and historian with a focus on the origins and history of wrestling, the world's oldest sport. He is a member of 11 Hall of Fames, with eight of those being wrestling-related, and is the author of more than 30 books. He is joining us from his home in Iowa today. How are things on that side of the planet, Mike? Uh, we're doing good over here, Jesse. It's a beautiful day in Iowa, about 50 degrees, and uh, I was one of the heartlands of wrestling in the whole world. So I've lived here all my life and I love it. It is. Um, well, again, I don't know what 50 degrees is because we deal with Celsius over here and it gets a Fahrenheit, but I mean, you're, you're, you're into winter now over there. Are you not? We're into winter. Yes. Mm. We'll be shoveling snow for the next three months. So today we're, we're going to, we're going to talk about the history of wrestling, everything through it. I've got huge gaps in my knowledge of this, which is why I reached out to you to, to talk about this. And as I said, I'm, I'm one of these, uh, you know, the, the growing wave of people who are starting to get into catch wrestling and understand a little bit more and, and the revolution that's sort of causing within martial arts at the moment. But uh, before we get into all that, you know, you had said that, that Iowa is this hotbed. What makes places like Iowa and where I think Ohio as well are really uh, cornerstones of, of American collegiate wrestling, are they not? That's a great question, Jesse. Um, there's several reasons that Iowa has this great tradition in wrestling. I give a lot of speeches on the history of wrestling and I tell people, think back to the 1850s, 1860s, the type of people that were moving west, frontier people, pioneers trying to carve out a living. They came up to the Mississippi River, uh, a formidable body of water. They built little rafts, they went across the river carrying their household goods, their children, a few animals. Then they came into Iowa. Iowa was about 80% forest land back then. And so they had to cut down trees and carve a living out of the soil. We have harsh winters here. We had Indian tribes. So I tell people, think of the type of spirit, the type of grit these people had to have to come in and settle places like Iowa and Kansas and Oklahoma uh, people with courage, grit, fortitude, and those are the kind of people that make great wrestlers. So you're, those are the kind of people that make great wrestlers. So you're thinking back to the late 1880s, early 1900s, there was very little organized sports. So on weekends, these pioneer families would get together and they'd have uh, village picnics and they'd have foot races and see who could throw a stone the furthest and things like that. And invariably, they'd have a wrestling match. And somebody from a little village over here would say, hey, we've got a pretty good boy over here named Jesse. Uh, I think he could whip your best boy named Frank. And pretty soon you'd have a small wages going on and people gather around. And it was very important to the prestige of a community to have the best wrestler around. And it was a frontier style that maybe employed collar and elbow that came over from Lanchester, England, mixed in with a frontier style. And, and let me make, digress for a moment and say, in 1831, in the small village of New Salem, Illinois, a lanky youngster came to town. He was 23 years old, and he worked in a small store there. And not far away was a tavern where the Clary boys hung out, and they were a tough crowd. Well, the proprietor of this little store told the owner of the bar, I've got a boy here. I think he could whip your Jack Armstrong. His name's Abe Lincoln. So in 1831, Abraham Lincoln wrestled Jack Armstrong on a small patch of grass in New Salem, Illinois. Jesse, I have stood on that patch of grass three times. I've held two seminars there telling people the kind of match it would have been. And I've also written a book called The Sport of Lincoln. It's only 60 pages. But I tell why the match took place, how the style was wrestled, and the end result, the two men became very good friends. And one of them went on to become kind of famous, uh, perhaps the most famous person ever born in the Western Hemisphere. Even as a Canadian who lives in Australia, I'm familiar with Abe Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> um, they say 12,000 books have been written about Abraham Lincoln, and that's second only, only to Jesus of Nazareth. So yeah, right. uh, he's a pretty popular fellow. Hmm. Um, so we're talking so, sort of uh, about that area. I mean, 
the the frontier people that were moving across was there sort of organized religion or do do you believe that on the frontier when it was coming over that that it was being developed independently through this small group of frontiersmen or would they have learned that art at some point in time during during their life prior to you know it becoming scholastic i suppose that that's another very good question wrestling came over with the first colonists in the 1600s settled on the eastern seaboard and wrestling was very popular in Vermont and Maine and places like that. They called it collar and elbow because of the way they would hook up and tie up. But then another style evolved too, where they would call it side wrestling. And you and I would stand on a patch of grass. Uh, we'd nod or shake hands. We'd grab each other around the waist. The match hadn't started yet. We'd try to get comfortable, kind of like a clinch in Greco-Roman. Mm. And then the third person who was supervising, and I use that term roughly, would say go and you'd try to fling me to the ground or i'd try to fling you to the ground and uh back then uh, the rules evolved first it was just who could throw who other down and then it became whoever could pin the other and then uh through the years it became well you got to make him submit so it evolved into a rough catch catch can style and that originated over in lancaster england area and particularly the Wigan School, who I'm sure you've heard much about, the Wigan Snake Pit. Yes. So it all gets kind of murky, Jesse, but all these styles began to blend together into a rough frontier style where it was basically anything went except for eye gouging and hooking and knee, uh, knees to the groin. So uh, it's, I guess, in terms of modern day wrestling, because there, the, the origins for wrestling, like virtually every nation has its own variation of this. Like when you talk about, um, so did you call it side wrestling on the belt? You can still see a lot of this and trying to think of some, some cultures, but like the jacket yeah. rest, Welsh wrestling, there's a, there's a lot of people using still belts and jacket wrestling that, that sort of apply to that style. Don't they? In, in, Those Hindus, I believe, don't they? Hindus, I think yeah. They yeah, it, like you said, I think the last time I saw there were 102 nations that had wrestling of some form. Mm. Eskimos have it, uh, small tribes in Africa have it. It's the universal sport, and that's why we call it mankind's oldest sport. The oldest piece of extant literature in the world is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yes. Gilgamesh was a warrior king in ancient Sumer 6,000 years ago. And one of the main themes of the wrestling match between Gilgamesh and a giant from the form forest named Inkadu. So you look at that, Jesse, one of the oldest stories in the world has a wrestling motif to it. Then you go to the Bible, Jacob wrestling the angel of the Lord. And of course, when I give speech at the wrestling groups, I say, now remember, God didn't send down the angel to play soccer, golf, or basketball. <laughs> and, not the wrestling. and then you look at uh, the Iliad of Homer. And uh, when, when, Achilles' best friend Patroclus dies in the funeral games. The most honored portion of the of the games centered around wrestling. Odysseus wrestled the giant Ajax. And we know I've done a lot of research on Achilles. I've actually written a novel about Achilles. And uh, my son and I, Jason, went to Troy uh, in 2006. And I, we stood on the tomb of Achilles. And Achilles was a wrestler. His father, Peleus, wrestled he was one of Jason's Argonauts that sailed into the Black Sea, and he was the champion wrestler. So wrestling has this incredible history from Gilgamesh to Jacob to Achilles to Abraham Lincoln, and it's, it's just spread all around the world. It is the ultimate ubiquitous sport. I think it's it's also an interesting point that you mentioned that I think for a lot of people, some people might be hearing for the first time that these were real people. They're, they're mythological and part of folklore now, but they they existed. Absolutely. And I was on, after I went to Troy, the largest newspaper in the state of Iowa, the Des Moines Register, did a big front page story on the travel section it said, Iowa author walked in the footsteps of his hero. And there's the largest radio talk show host in the state called me up and he said, so you think Achilles was a real person, huh? And there was really a Trojan war. And I said, absolutely. And he said, well, I'm going to rip you to shreds on my show. And I said, okay. Jan, have at it. And I went on the show and I taught, I walked him through it where the legend of the uh, invincibility of Achilles came from. He was a genetic freak, like a Bruce Lee or a Muhammad Ali or a Dan Gable. And the Greeks didn't understand genetics. So of course he had to have a goddess for a mother to explain why he was so much better than everybody else. Yeah, right. And the hero invulnerability. 
Uh, that's easily explained, and I, I won't take up your time unless you want me to. And also, uh, the legend of the man horse, centaurs. That's easily explained. And by the time I got off the, the radio show, he called me back and said, well, you convinced me there really was an Achilles and there really was a Trojan War. What's the story of the centaur again? I remember hearing this again, but it, it, that, that there was a, it was an actual person or something that, uh, through yeah, mythology. That, got... The legend is, of course, that they're half man and half horse. Yes. Well, Greece is very, very hilly, hilly. And most of the, uh, the city states developed out in flatlands where they rode around in chariots, real dignified. Mm. And up in the hills were the hill people. And uh, the men, there were small ponies that they rode, ponies, they were kind of like Shetland ponies. And suppose you and I are in a chariot and we're driving around and we see up in the hills, a flock of horse, small horses going by with naked men on them, bent <laughs> over with long flowing hair. And we call them the man horse. There go the men horse. Well, that, that morphed into the centaurs, uh, yeah. creatures that were both man and horse. Uh, okay. They were, it's just behind all legends, the legend of Hercules. Somebody said, you think there was a real Hercules? And I said, sure. And they said, so he did the 12 labors and diverted the flow of rivers and went to Hades. And I said, of course not. He was a person that lived in a, a small village in Greece and he probably lifted a boulder that nobody else could lift. Mm. Years later, some after he died, somebody said, I saw him pick up and walk 50 yards with it. Somebody else said, I saw him pick it up above his head and throw it 50 feet. Somebody else said, I saw him walk away with two of them. Well, you know how legends. Uh, it's the fishing story, up, isn't it? Sure, sure. Yeah. And the stories take on uh, a life of their own. They become embellished and they become a part of culture. Hmm. So how, how far back? I mean, you're, you're alluding to this, but what's... What's the first mention that we have of wrestling? Is it, is it Gilgamesh? Do they talk yes. about that there? Do we have anything beyond that? Well, I guess the, that's really like the first, first origin stories, isn't it? Yes, it really is. And of course, he's searching for the key to immortality. And he goes to find a man who has survived the flood named Utna Pishtim. And there are people who say that's the equivalent to Noah in the Bible. And of course, uh, a lot of people think that the Garden of Eden was somewhere there in the cradle of civilization between the Euphrates and the Tigris and Samar is now where Iraq is. So mm. in fact, Jesse, a friend of mine was in the service and he was an officer and he led a group by this rubble of rock out in the middle of nowhere. And he couldn't wait to get back here and say to me, Mike, have you ever heard of Ur? You are. And I said, sure. That's where Gilgamesh was king. And he said, wow, that's what I thought. And he sent me a picture of what are the remnants of Ur. And I said, you know, that's where, and he was a wrestler. And I said, that's where Gilgamesh wrestled Enkidu 6,000 years ago. And it's also on the hieroglyphics inside the pyramids, there are figures of, of men that look like they're doing wrestling holds. So it goes hmm. back 6,000 years. Well, where does it hit it, it, its peak? Is, is this when we talk about like sort of the Greek Olympics of, of if we talk about the pre-Christian era, that's when it's at its, uh, as, at its peak effectively? Probably Milo of Greece, uh, won six Olympic Games, the Olympiad, and was the greatest wrestler of that era. The, the, the Greeks started the Olympics in 776 BC. But I would say, in my estimation, wrestling hit its greatest degree of popularity in 1905 with Frank Gott. That's, that's um, quite a I, jump. That's quite a jump in time. Yeah. Well, it's been around as a form of self-defense and, and uh, a sporting quote unquote activity, but I don't think, well, you look back to the uh, Olympic games, it was one of the 10 original sports. Mm. And I've, I've found comments that it was the most respected back then, but for it to have, take on what it, when Frank Gotch of Humboldt, Iowa, and that goes back to your original question, why Iowa? So I said, originally it's the kind of people that settled here. And second of all, it's because we had Frank Gotch. He was born in a small uh, town in Northwest Iowa called Humboldt, grew up on a farm, the youngest of nine children, and he just liked to wrestle. Mm -hmm. And as I told your audience, wrestling was a big deal back then in these villages. And he quickly uh, asserted himself as the number one local wrestler and he became American champion. And then he set his eyes on George Hackenschmidt, the feared Russian lion who was the recognized world champion. And he beat him in 1908 in front of 10,000 people. He became an overnight celebrity, Jesse. I say as big as LeBron James is today or 
uh, any Tom Brady or anybody you want to mention. And all the newspapers, he was front page news. Uh, he was the star of a play that went up and down the East Coast. Uh, President Teddy Roosevelt invited him to the White House twice. Uh, the Hollywood industry was just starting up and they tried to contract him to make uh, a series of movies. Uh, there was talk about him even running for governor in Iowa one time and I teased Jesse Ventura about that once. I said, if Gotch would have run, Jesse, you wouldn't have gotten any publicity at all for being the first wrestler to be a governor. And when he wrestled Hackenschmidt in the rematch in Comiskey Park in Chicago in 1911, 31,000 people showed up. Mm, I've seen some footage of that. Huge all over America. Mm. So not, he was outgoing. He was friendly. He was charming. He was handsome. And the media loved him. We're jumping a bit. I, I'd like to get to that point. But there's a, sure. there's a, a little bit of time in there. I mean, it's, we'll, we'll start talking about sort of the... The, the origins of, of modern day wrestling. Is there sort of anything more from the, from the Greek Olympics? I guess, as I said, I've, I've got a keen interest in, in MMA. So when they talk about pancreas and stuff where you would ultimately have the boxer versus the wrestler, sure. you know, you've, you've already said that um, wrestling was probably more respected. Do you know why they were kind of considered separate sports? Cause they really do seem like they should be kind of integrated into one or, you know, I guess anything more about the lineage because that, from my understanding, seemed to become the pinnacle event, which which was the athletes and you get the best boxer versus the best wrestler in, in sort of this anything goes type competition. Are, are you saying that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing you on the question, rephrase it. Rather what I'm saying is it seems um, odd to me that you would might, might only learn just wrestling or just boxing because it, it seems ah. these days the two would be naturally integrated. Well, that, that is, that's an intriguing question. And I'm not sure I can answer it. Um, I piddled around with boxing when I was in the Navy. I wrestled three years in the Navy and I was good friends with the boxing coach, just a charming older gentleman. And he was always trying to get me to come out for the boxing team and see if this makes sense to you, Jesse. The only American I know to win national titles in both boxing and wrestling is the great Dan Hodge. And he was three-time NCAA wrestling champion, never lost. And then he turned to boxing and he won the National Golden Gloves with 17 and 0 and 14 knockouts. Here's what he told me. It's a, he said, it's a completely separate mindset to be a boxer and a wrestler. Uh, you approach the two sports differently. Yeah, almost every wrestler, including Dan Severn, the MMA champion, who's one of my close friends, said, all you hear when you're growing up is don't punch, don't hit. You're just out there to wrestle. And it's ingrained in you. So it, I, I guess I'm trying to figure back, back in the ancient Greece, did these athletes make a choice? I want to be a striker and a puncher, or do I want to be a wrestler? And then like you mentioned, pancreas combined them. But from what I've been able to find out, pancreas just never really caught on. Uh, yes, it was one of, it was there and it was popular but not as much as wrestling. And I think wrestling was even more popular than boxing. Yeah, right, okay. Um, do, you know any, do you know anything about the period? Like, you know, I, I've, I've, I've broken a few bones doing this o over the years. Do you have any information about um, how they would deal with injury? Because it, it doesn't seem that hard to believe that, you know, when you're posting off, off a suplex or, uh, or a high crotch or something, and all of a sudden, you know, the arm breaks or pops the other way, have you, have you looked at any of, of how they dealt with medicine and, and healing injuries from that period in time? Do we know anything about it? No, I sure don't. And I would guess uh, it would be the, the advice you get. Suck it up. It'll fix. <laughs> let, let me, I want to tell you the worst injury I've ever seen in a wrestling match was a friend of mine, Randy Lewis, two-time NCAA champion at Iowa, ended up being 1984 Olympic champion. His senior year, he was in a match in front of 14,000 people and his foe picked him up and took him down and as he went down, he he put out his right arm to brace himself, and mm. the elbow went the other way. Yeah. And I tell you, the referee almost threw up looking at it. And Dan Gable was the coach, and he come running out and had to look the other way. And uh, they snapped that elbow back in, Jesse. But I was there in press row. That's the worst accident I've ever seen in wrestling, or samba, or judo. Uh, and I'm surprised you don't see more of that, frankly. You see yeah broken fingers and cauliflower ears and uh broken noses and swollen eyes even in amateur wrestling 
Yeah, well, I, I just, uh, I, I just broke my leg a few months ago training. So, mm. I'm sorry. Oh, I said I had just broken my leg a few months ago training effectively, just working from from a sitting position. And as I stood up, I used my rear leg to post. And as he came down on me, it just it just snapped the fibula because there was nowhere for it to go. So, oh, I'm, it's one of a few injuries that I've had. But um, you know, it's it's quite surprising. I have um, there, there's another mate that I know who. Uh, a few years ago, he told me he was running a gym and one of their members died at their gym because he was effectively spiked or something at, at some point and landed on his head and broke the neck and, and effectively went, went brain dead from it. I'm quite surprised that, um, Oh my goodness. I guess you, you don't hear a little bit more about, about this stuff because they all, the focus seems to be on, on boxing, but you know, if, if you watch uh, a little bit of MMA and you, you remember guys like Kevin Randleman, they are scary, seriously scary looking guys. <laughs> Yeah, I, I knew Kevin a little bit. Yeah, he was uh, he was something. He was a physical Adonis, no doubt about it. And I've had people say to me, MMA looks so dangerous. You know, why would anybody go into that? And I said, well, look at Christopher Reeve playing mm. super. And he's a, he's an excellent equestrian, and he gets paralyzed for life riding a horse. horse. Yeah. And Sonny Bono, Sonny and Cher, is skiing down skiing, a slope. Yeah. And so life isn't without risk. Uh, but you can minimize it by the way you approach it and trying to be cautious. But like the accident that happened to you, Jesse, mm. there's no way to escape something like that. You did everything right. You stood up and something snapped. Yeah. So um, I guess that, that'll sort of, I guess, finish off, I guess, talking about antiquity. So you're, you've already jumped into Frank Goss, but before I get into that, that period, do you know where, you know, wrestling seems to disappear from history for a large period of time. I think, you know, it starts picking up at least what I'm read again, sort of around the middle ages. And it's what, maybe around the 17 to 1800s before it begins to get formalized into some form of sport or entertainment through different road shows. When do you hear about it sort of picking up and, and I guess re returning back to, to relevance? Well, you're making a good point uh, because I guess I've been involved in studying the history of wrestling for 50 years. And I think I know quite a bit about the antiquity and quite a bit about uh, from 1900 up, but there does seem to be a real dark age there, uh, to coin a popular phrase, where you don't hear much about wrestling. Mm. And I don't know if it was just frowned upon by the elites and society began to flower and blossom and you saw more divisions and it just became what you would call a, a, a lower echelon sport that just farmers and peasants engaged in, so it didn't get much coverage or what. But that's a good question, Jesse, and I don't have the answer for it. It just does seem to go into a, a long blank period. And so what, when is it? Is it the late 1700s or early 1800s when it, it starts to kind of pick up again and become something? Do you, or... Yes. As I alluded to earlier, the colonists that came over from England uh, brought with them a love for wrestling, a certain really? number okay. of them. And you would start to see these small villages and on weekends they would look for entertainment and you'd see foot races and who could throw a boulder the farthest or timber, a piece of wood, and it evolved into wrestling matches and not boxing because once again, you know, boxing, you get hurt badly from boxing. Mm. If you're, if you're a pure wrestling and you another guy puts your shoulders through the match, you just, that's the end of the match. You yeah. don't come away basically with broken nose and, and brain damage and this this place jaw or anything so i just think it was more accepted as a more sporting event than boxing and well you know when john l sullivan fought jake kilrain 45 rounds they had to do it on a barge mm. because boxing was boycotted everywhere in the united states when jack johnson fought uh, jim jeffries in reno Originally, it was going to be in California, in the state of California, banned it. They had protests all over, women's group marching. Then they wanted to do it in Utah. Utah said, not here. And finally, Nevada let them. So boxing had that bad reputation that wrestling didn't, didn't have back in that era. Okay. So when, when do you remember it becoming sort of a thing where, because it, it, it would have been, I assume, localized, but at some point it became a traveling entertainment show. So, in, you know, when I think of the way that, um, carnival shows would go from town to town. That's sort of the way that I envision the the modern form kind of redeveloping its popularity and where you start to develop names and, and superstars out of it. Do I have that roughly correct? Would it have been sort of a traveling show? I think you have it very correctly. 
And once again, I use the analogy of village people looking for something to do. Buffalo Bill, who was an island, by the way, before he went west and became famous, uh, started his Wild West show in the 1890s. He had uh, wrestlers and boxers, mostly wrestlers involved, and uh, people wanted to come to see these contests. And then pretty soon, somebody with a smaller carnivals would say, you know, you got a local tough guy there in town. Well, my guy will take him on. And if we can last 15 minutes with him, we'll pay off. And they usually couldn't because like my great friend Luthez would say, these carny wrestlers had a lot of tricks up their sleeve and they weren't there to lose money. Yeah. And you might carry somebody for 10 or 15 minutes and make it look good. And then all of a sudden, boom, a double wrist lock or a, a, knee, a, knee, a knee lock and the match is over. But one thing they would like to do is make it close for 10 minutes or so. Yes. And then all of a sudden the local guy would get beat and all the friends would say, man, you had him. You could have won that. <laughs> and they would say, hey, try it again tomorrow night and bring your friends. And then it'd be a bigger group. Okay. And side bets, side bets were real as, you know, the human yeah, species would like to place money. And pretty soon betting was, was the genesis for that. And boy, these carny wrestlers were tough old boys. They did, like Luthez said, they didn't get into this to lose money for the boss or for themselves. So uh, I think uh, it, in my head, we're already skewing to wrestling territories where it become fixed professional wrestling. So I, I want to avoid talking about that first thing and get through to the sure. crux of, of its popularity at the, the turn of the century in the 1900s. So it sounds, from what you're telling me, it sounds like it's, it, it redevelops its popularity around like the uh, 1880s, 1890s, uh, becomes this traveling show. And at that point in time, like, do we, I guess I, I'm asking multiple questions here because you're, you're talking about how, you know, there's still... English wrestling, English wrestling from uh, uh, Lancaster. You've now probably got uh, a full Americanized version that travels around. Have they branched off into variants of the same sport? Are they still very much the same? Is it the English coming over, becoming Americans who are bringing it over? Do you know much about that sort of period and, and what was happening then? Yeah, I, I think the foundation was basically the same. Uh, take the guy down either pin him or joint lock him. Yeah, that comes from Lancaster in my estimation. And then you could say that, well, that goes back to the ancient Greek style. But when two people square off, you gotta be able to, to take him down to get an advantage mm. uh, if it's gonna be a pure sport. And then once you have him on the ground, as you know, from your BJJ experience, the, the goal is BJJ doesn't go for pins, but catch wrestling goes for a pin or a joint lock. Mm. And uh, it just became very nuanced, very competitive, a lot of prides involved. And again, it goes back to the local villagers wanting to see something exciting in their life. They lived lives of drudgery. There weren't any movies. There wasn't any radio. There wasn't any internet. There wasn't any baseball, uh, so to speak, maybe sandlot games. And wrestling just kind of found a void in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So we can pretty comfortably say that, that Lancaster then is, is the home of modern submission wrestling in that, that sense as, as we might know it then outside of, you know, judo. I, I, believe, sort of that's the case. I believe so. And yeah. I'm sure you know who Billy Robinson is. And I do. I've, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about him shortly as well. I spent quite a bit of time with Billy when we inducted him into our pro wrestling hall of fame. Uh, my wife and I created the international wrestling Institute museum and ran it for 12 years. Okay. And, uh, it was really tough getting the amateurs to buy into the professional part of the sport. And we can talk about that later, okay. but, but yeah, um, the, the rudiments are the same. I, I believe, uh, take the guy down and pin him or submit him. That hasn't changed since the days of Gilgamesh. Although Gilgamesh didn't go for the pin. He went for the submission or the other guy to say, I've had enough. Mm. So back then, so as, as I said, we're starting to get more into catch and looking at it as, as a dedicated program. And, and, and what I know is you can see, it, it becomes very clear what you can see that's been adopted for professional wrestling and where that comes from. So when we talk about catch as a program, which would have been the, um, you know, the, the primary form back then, at least on the outside looking at this point in time, it doesn't seem as though we have as many sort of typical double legs or blast shots the way that you see typically in the collegiate program. Had that portion of the game not fully been developed at that point in time, or am I just still involved a lot more in the, 
you know, the, the collar and tie and headlocks and that sort of activity? Well, I, I think you've hit on both answers. Any sport evolves, any sport picks up nuances that can uh, complement the sport or the athlete. When Frank Gotch wrestled George Hackenschmidt, Hackenschmidt was, had a great background in Greco. So he liked to be a slow moving, gri gripping strength type contest where Gotch wanted to bob and move and weave and move him around and shoot. He, Cause he was looking for an opening like mm. Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, how would he do against Jack Dempsey or uh, look at Jack Johnson, how he fought, he revolutionized boxing with his motion and his fast hands and the things he could do. So um, to answer your question, I think the basics were there and it just continued to evolve to make it more exciting uh, for the fans and to give the athlete a better chance. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're trying, who, who were the first guys that uh, I think you started mentioning some guys, we start looking at the late, uh, late 1890s. My understanding of it is that there's a few dominant characters who are, are winning all the titles, which have, uh, ultimately ends up leading it to becoming professional fixed wrestling. But what's sort of happening around the, the turn of 1900? Who, who are the superstars? What do we know about this? Well, have you heard the name William Muldoon? No. Okay, William Muldoon started, he became a bugle boy in the Civil War who at the age of 16. Right. So we're talking 1860. And he learned to wrestle in the Union camps. The U Ulysses S. Grant really believed in wrestling between battles to keep his men hardened right. and, and mentally tough. And wrestling in the camps became a big deal. And William Muldoon became the Greco-Roman heavyweight champion of the world in the 1880s and then became a legendary stage actor and figure. And the book about him, his biography, is called The Solid Man of Sport. He became the commissioner of boxing and wrestling in New York City. I'm giving you all this background because he became such an esteemed person, Jesse. Well, he said in his biography, I thank my wrestling credentials to the Civil War. So mm -hmm. William Muldoon became the first really superstar of all sports. In fact, I have a William Muldoon sport card from 1885. Yeah, all right. John McMahon was a big name. Edward Bibby was. Uh, and these people actually had their own sports cards along with uh, runners and broad jumpers and people like that. No baseball players or football players. My uh, William Muldoon 1887 card, I just saw one on eBay not too long ago, posted for $1,000. I don't know if somebody's going to get $1,000 for it, yeah. but mine in, was in better shape than that. So William Muldoon became the first real superstar of the sport. And then uh, a lot of people thought, well, we should have a major national tournament. The AAU started its national tournament in 1888. And there were only two divisions, 135 and under and 136 and over. And they didn't want any pros in there, of course. They just wanted amateurs. So pretty soon, uh, amateur wrestling began to flower too because the professional wrestling, because of people like Muldoon, was getting all this newspaper coverage. Just goes back to the media. The media, the media, the media, if the media hypes it, it soon is going to take over the conscience of the people. And just that and horse racing were about the only things around. So Muldoon got tremendous newspaper coverage on the East Coast and even across the Midwest. And so he was your first real superstar. You mentioned something interesting there when you said that he was Greco-Roman. So, you know, I know freestyle Greco-Roman again when we talk about antiquity periods and then what that is in the modern olympics and scholastic wrestling but you're saying even at this point in time because i was kind of under the impression that catch was the base style of wrestling but you still had catch greco-roman and freestyle all operating simultaneously around the, the late 1800s uh tough question to really delve into we had greco for sure greco-roman was huge in europe and hackenschmidt came out of estonia and russia Okay. Uh, and he liked, he was extremely strong. Do you know much about Hackenschmidt? I've, I've been able to get some of the, um, the, there are a few really kind people online who, who are rescanning in these books from like the early 1900s that don't have, um, copyright on them anymore. And I've seen some of the photos and he has got to be the largest looking man that I, it, it looks like he comes from a modern weight room without having, Absolutely. It, he, he's, he looks enormous compared to the typical, 
back shoulders, broad sternum that you would normally associate with guys who were strong men around the 40s and 50s. He looks completely different to them. Yeah, you're, excuse me, you're exactly right. He was one of those genetical freaks. Um, mm. He, at one point, he was considered to be the strongest man in the world. He could take a non-revolving barbell and, you know, when you snap it up to your sh shoulders, the plates don't rotate. It's a solid weight and ram it overhead up to 360 pounds when he was 19 years old. Yeah. That's an incredible amount of weight. And he had that incredible physique. So when he started wrestling and they brought him to London, he filled the opera houses. That's where a lot of the matches were, hold, okay. were held back then. And women started to come because they wanted to see this Adonis that they'd heard so much about. Hackenschmidt became the toast of London and all of Europe, really, for his incredible physique, his wrestling prowess, and it was all Greco-Roman at that point. Okay. He liked to come in solidly and wade into a guy and they'd maneuver around, and it was basically a game of strength. And uh, he also was fluent by the end of his life in like seven languages. He once challenged uh, Albert Einstein to a debate <laughs> on relativity Right. Uh, he wrote a book called Man and Consciousness, which I have the original copy of, and taught, wrote a book called The Way to Live, which you may have seen uh, pages of, and I have the original copy of that. Uh, he was just, just a phenomenon, but when he came to America, he wasn't prepared for the type of wrestling that Frank Gotts was going to present him. The fluid motion, the bobbing and the weaving, the hooking, the over uh, pulling him in. Rope a dope, very similar to what Muhammad Ali did to Sonny Liston the first time. A lot of inside fighting that that was removed from boxing with uh, inside ties, overhooks to really get rid of the arms and, and eliminate them from nah, uh, right. the level change and that sort of activity. In John L. Sullivan's day, there was a lot of wrestling going on. There was, yeah. There's an entire book on it that that I want to get out, and they talk about how you know prior to I can't. Even, I can't even remember. I think, you know, when they talk about the old Queensberry rules like that, they're saying the sure. reason they had that outside style is because they were trying to avoid the clinch because they would let you pretty much free fight on the inside. And it wasn't until the introduction of these rules that it became known as dirty boxing because prior to that, all these inside ties and fighting with uppercuts and hooks were uh, inherent in boxing. That's right. Absolutely. Mm, it, was, it was quite fascinating. And, and so, by the way, getting back to William Muldoon, he became John L. Sullivan's trainer when John became the heavyweight champion of the world and was such a, a boozer. Uh, and he would go into a bar, and you've heard this stuff before, I can whip any SOB in the house. You know? yes. Well, Muldoon was in the house one day, and uh, Muldoon wasn't a drinker, and he tried to settle him down, and they had a scuffle. Yeah, and right. Muldoon took him, right, took him right down and held him down. And uh, Sullivan was impressed and decided to clean up his act, and Muldoon actually trained him for a while. Yeah, all right. And, yeah. Yep. So when, so this is 1905, roughly what we're talking about, talking about in terms of the period? Uh, a little bit earlier for what I was just talking about with Muldoon. Muldoon was champion in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. Then Hackenschmidt was the next superstar. He came along in uh, 1900. He won his world title, I think, in 1904. And then he uh, wrestled Gotch in 1908. Okay. And that's when it really took off in America, when Gotch beat Hackenschmidt. So for, for people that might be listening to this that, that don't actually follow this, you know, Greco-Roman is effectively from the hips up. Freestyle means that you can attack the legs. And when we talk about catch, it's a combination of the two where you can submit from the feet or on the ground. Is um, So Hackenschmidt comes over, he said he's Eastern European. Then does that imply, was Greco-Roman the predominant form of wrestling over there then before he came over? Or, you know, was it still geographically sparse between who was practicing what style at that point in time? I think the Atlantic Ocean separated the styles of wrestling. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the old style was the European classical style of Greco-Roman. And by the way, it doesn't get its name from ancient Greece or Rome. It gets its name from a French uh, version of upper body classical classical style wrestling and it just adopted the name Greco-Roman, but it really flourished in France early on. And Hackenschmidt became the toast of Europe. And so that became the style that people looked up to. And when he came to America because of Abraham Lincoln and people like that, Lincoln got a lot of publicity when he was running for president uh, for being a wrestler. In fact, I just read a biography of him recently where they make the case that uh, his wrestling match with Jack Armstrong may have been the turning point in his life. It's the first time he ever tried something and was successful at it and, and developed confidence in who he was and what he could do. 
Right. So Lincoln's wrestling prowess got quite a bit of publicity, and it's been exaggerated tremendously through the years. I read somewhere that he was record was 301, and he was Illinois state champ and regional champ. Well, there weren't any state championships. <laughs> yeah. back there, and he certainly didn't wrestle 300 matches, and you couldn't even call them matches. There were no rules and no officials or anything. They were grappling skirmishes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's anyway, very similar to the, the start of, you know, UFC, the, the, the first five UFCs, they'd be pulling out fighters who apparently had 300 no records, but there's, there's absolutely no, um, nowhere that it can be verified. Right. Uh, okay. So, so does that mean then, uh, Hackenschmidt comes from Greco-Roman wrestling? Gotch would, he, he's considered a pure catch wrestler. So Hackenschmidt's Greco-Roman. Does... In fact, shameless plug, I wrote a book. I wrote a book that Paladin Press, which just went out of business, was the largest publisher of sports books, uh, martial arts books in America. And the title is The Life and Legacy of Frank Gotch, King of the Catches Catch Can Wrestlers. And I didn't, I, I wrote the manuscript when they commissioned me to write it, but I didn't pick the title. Uh, so yeah, there's Paladin Books, which was the number one publisher of martial arts books in America that called him the king of the catch catch can wrestlers and i think it's a well-deserved title I, I i think he is the person who really put catch over so does that mean that hackenschmidt needs to adopt his game and begin to learn standing submissions at that point in time because that's that's not inherent or was that included in greco-roman at the time well uh great question i don't think there was hardly any submissions back then uh everything i've read uh, jesse is they went for the pin Okay. When he wrestled Madrilai, the Turk, in London, they said the traffic jams, horses and carriages, and foot traffic around the opera house was immense for hours. It was a packed house of 8,000 only. Uh, Hackenschmidt came in, and they said he took off his robe, and you could hear gasps from the audience. <laughs> and he got Madrilai, the terrible Turk, in a waist lock, bear hug, and took him to his uh, back and pinned him in a minute and 30 seconds or something. It was a one fall match. And so, you know, think if you were a spectator, you could say, I saw something amazing, but was it worth the money I paid for a minute and 50 seconds or whatever? So <laughs> Hackenschmidt was a master at the bear hug and sucking somebody in with that incredible power we've already talked about. Well, Gotch wasn't going to let him suck him in. Uh, mm -hmm. Gotch was going to move, float, underhook him, push him around. And Hackenschmidt later and his followers said Gotch wrestled dirty. Well, yeah. he didn't wrestle okay. dirty. He wrestled the frontier style. When you come to America, you wrestle America style. And Hackenschmidt knew it was going to be a catch, a catch. And I'm a huge fan of Hackenschmidt as a person and as an athlete. And I've had people accuse me, yeah, you just don't like Hackenschmidt. And I said, I love Hackenschmidt. Uh, I just am a realist. He couldn't adapt to that style. So you, you've touched on a very interesting point here. And the reason why, at least in the circles that I'm in, why catch is developing such a flavor again is because it's a combination of stand-up wrestling with submissions integrated in. But you've said that, you know, when these guys are wrestling, they were predominantly going for the pin. So is this again, another piece of revised history where they're implying that all of these submissions were there and constantly used, but they actually weren't because when it came down to it, it was still a, a more modern wrestling match where it's just about being able to put the guy on his back good point i think that can be uh discussed uh at, uh at great length from my research i find that it was mostly still about the pin they would maybe get a toe hold or a joint lock to force you to your back but back in those days uh it seems to me it was basically about the pin get him to his back and hold him immobile so that he can't move uh, more so than the joint lock submission. Now, there were joint lock submissions, but I don't think it was near as popular back then as it's become. That's interesting because because catch as catch can suggests that you go for submission wherever you can. So this almost sets up the fact that you're just going to attack something to create a sprawl situation or something to then reestablish control. Yeah, or it could mean catch as catch can, catch the best maneuver holds you can to get the guy down and turn him. So you can look at it to, for two different ways. I, I grew up in a scholastic style of wrestling. And boy, uh, I grew up in Waterloo, Iowa, which is a real hotbed of wrestling. Uh, numerous state and national champions and several Olympians have come out of there. And if you were in practice when I was 16, 17 years old and the other guy grunted loudly or 
or cried out in pain where the match was stopped immediately. And what did you do? And this is a wrestling match. You're not supposed to hurt somebody. So that's ingrained in you in scholastic wrestling, Jesse, mm. is you don't hurt the other person. You outscore him. This is a contest between gentlemen. And, uh, but I, I've seen the transformation, the transition uh, ever since MMA uh, made its grand entry onto the scene and I've seen the shift toward more submission and BJJ. I greatly admire BJJ wrestling and catch wrestling and people like that. Um, it, 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 I'm going to be real candid here for a minute and I may regret it, but I got into wrestling as a means of self-defense. I was a small kid. Um, I went to a school that uh, had a lot of racial strife in it, and uh, I wanted to learn how to protect myself. And I saw wrestling on TV, Lufez and Vern Gagne and people like that. And I just wanted to know how to take somebody down and control them. Mm. And I think a lot of my friends were that way, too. They, they saw it as a, as a self-defense technique rather than a demolition yeah, right. Okay. Of combat. And I've seen the transition. Uh, one of my best friends is Dan Severn. Mm. Dan the Beast Severn. I know him and very he well. Told me he just stayed at my house uh, last year and we sat, we went for a long walk. Uh, I always walk uh, an hour, uh, five days a week. And we walked and came back and sat and talked till early in the morning. And he said he has people all the time say to him, Boy, you must be a really tough fighter. And he, a great fighter. And he says, well, actually, I've never had a fight in my life. I'm a very great competitor. Mm. I love to compete. And uh, he learned, and he almost always went for the pin. Uh, I'm not sure how well Dan would do in the UFC today, but he, he's adaptable. He could make a, a, the, the transition, but I've seen it become a lot more submission oriented. Well, I remember uh, he was still having MMA fights into his 50s in, in regional organizations. He's still doing it now. He's 60. Yeah. Still yeah. doing it. I think he's been in the ring or an octagon 140 times the last time. I just helped him with his latest. He's writing a biography. Okay. In fact, he was just in Australia last year. Mm. Uh, but that was an, that was a pro wrestling match. Mm. So um, we, we, I want to get to the modern stuff, but I'm just, you know, as I said, my, my interest in talking to you is to understand the timeline of how this develops a little bit better. So, you know, we've got Gotch and, and Hackenschmidt. What happens? They have, they have how many belts and what, what you say Gotch becomes the, the biggest household name. I assume by that point in time, we start getting closer to the, the Second World War. What's the time frame that we're looking at? And the popularity of Catch then and ultimately Catch starts skewing off into fixed wrestling. We've got, you know, you've already sort of touched on how different parts of the country are run by territories and how this is all going to start to work. Cause that all really starts getting into, you know, Vince McMahon's type activity a few years later and, and his father. Yeah. Um, well, the Gotch time period is prior to world war one. Okay. I mean, yeah. Gotch 1905 was, and pardon 1905. I think you said, was yeah, he actually that? won the American title in 1905 from a really tough guy named Tom Jenkins, who was really taught Gotch how to wrestle tough. Mm. He, he was about eight years older and about 20 pounds heavier and he'd been American champion. He only had one eye. He was a mill, right? A mill worker from Cleveland and he had calloused hands and rubbed his hands over your face and beat yeah. you all up. And the first time he wrestled Gotch, he literally beat the crap out of Gotch. Um, Gotch was a bloody mess and he went back to Humboldt and demanded a rematch and he beat Jenkins in a rematch for the title in what sports writers at ringside said was the most brutal exhibition of sports they'd ever seen. And uh, they actually would jab each other and push each other. And, and uh, they both claim the other one. Uh, would it's kind of like this. There's that slap, the slapping yes. kind of disguised as strikes almost within there. It exactly. Is, yeah. I'm just setting up my collar tie. Yeah. I, uh, but, uh, a little stronger than the need be. So, uh, he transformed Gotch into a really tough, mean wrestler. In fact, when Gotch uh, died at the age of 39 in 1917, uh, he had said several times Tom Jenkins was the toughest man he ever faced. And by the way, Tom Jenkins went on to West Point and taught hand-to-hand -hand technique to uh, West Point cadets for 37 years. Mm -hmm. And they idolized him there, just a tough old hombre. But so Gotch dies in 1917. He'd already given up the title. Uh, in 19... How does he die so young? 
Great question. Uh, for years, the rumor was he died of syphilis. And I never believed that because I'm a purist and I didn't want to believe it. And so I found when I wrote my, I've written two books about him. One's a novel called Gotch, an American Hero. And the other is the book by The Life and Legacy by Paladin Press. And I went to the courthouse and got the official death certificate. You have to be a family member usually to see it, but they knew who I was and I was an author and I had a certain reputation. They let me see it. It was kidney failure, uh, similar to Bright's disease. Get a load of this. The nation's leading expert on Bright disease and kidney failure, his name was Frank Gotch. He was a doctor in Seattle and his grandmother was Frank Gotch's sister. Really? And he said, how, how ironic, I became a specialist in this. And he had read my novel, Gotch, an American Hero. So he came back to Humboldt, read the, read the death certificate, and was very involved. And in, he wrote me a five page, he since passed away, saying Frank did, died of kidney failure. And it's very similar to syphilis when it starts out and then they branch off in two different directions. There's no question that that's what he died of. And it would have been a very sad, prolonged, painful death. Mm -hmm. And when he was, I've been, in the, I've been in the room where he died, Jesse, in his home in Humboldt. It's a beautiful home in the center of town, privately owned. I stood in the room where he passed away and they say he couldn't even lift his head off the pillow the last three days. Yeah, right. So, and he's buried in a beautiful mausoleum in uh, Humboldt, Iowa. And I've been there many times. I've given many speeches in Humboldt on Frank. So he died, but his legacy has lived over the Iowa landscape for 60 years. And um, when he died, uh, the next great champion was Joe Stecker okay. from Dodd, Nebraska. And when he wrestled, then he ran against Earl Caddock, a three-time AAU national champion, who wanted to wrestle in the 1920 Olympics. The World War canceled that. Farmer Burns, who trained Gotch, taught Caddock into turning pro. And they wrestled for the world title in Omaha in 1917. And there were like 10,000 people there, a complete sellout. And the Omaha newspaper, I've got it here somewhere, what they said about the match. And let me see if I can find it. I'm going to read it to you real quick. Here's how the Omaha newspaper described the first title bout between Caddock and Stecker in 1917. Quote, the first hour was occupied by the men in an uninteresting struggle on their feet, pushing, shoving, hauling, and doing everything but wrestling. Stecker finally took the first fall after one hour and 22 minutes, and then it was more of the same. The second bout was a re repetition of the monotonous stuff of the first session up to the 45th minute. I'm trying to answer your question. So you have two very talented, equally gifted wrestlers. If you've got one who can beat the other one easily, you'll see quick takedowns. You'll see them working for the pin or the submission. The fans love it. But you get two equally matched competitors who are aware of the other one's strengths and weaknesses and styles. Wrestling became boring. There is, um, have you ever watched, I believe it's the super fight. It's w with your mate, Dan Severn fighting Ken Shamrock. I think, I think it's the second time I want to say it's UFC eight and they pretty much circle each other for 30 minutes. And I believe there was, I can't remember. I don't think there was an overtime round. There was barely a strike thrown and, and it was considered it's one of the worst UFC matches ever. And of course, Dan says it, it is one of the most intellectually challenging chess matches that he's ever done but nothing more than like a few jabs were ever thrown out through a, an entire 30 minute match without any rounds right and i'm well aware of that match i'm <laughs> well aware of dan's uh, uh the way he describes it with a big smile uh i won't get into this but i want to tell you that dan severin fought butterbean in a boxing mm. match in osceola iowa uh well oh, 15 years ago and i was his corner man Wow, I was okay. there was Warner Man. And that's probably the most interesting, intriguing contest I've ever seen. Uh, it would take me a half hour to explain to you all the nuances. But yeah, Dan, you're right. That match was very boring. 
<laughs> Butterbean's another fascinating character because he he also has a a very deep place in in MMA, moving from boxing into you know Japanese prize fighting across um you know no sure. hold submission. But um, sure. uh, okay. there are some characters in these in these activities, aren't there? Uh, in, indeed, indeed, there are. Okay, so um, you had mentioned Farmer Burns. Now, this is another name that I've read about of of just a, a genuine badass who I've I've read about. Um, does he? sort of sit atop that same like like Gotch seems to be your your number one where do you rank him in, in terms of these guys around that period probably the greatest technical wrestler and strategist and teacher of all time mm -hmm. he only weighed 165 pounds but I don't know if you've ever have you ever seen the picture of him hanging by the neck uh from a tree no I'll send it to you okay uh Farmer Burns worked his neck so much that he would come into a town to try to drum up interest with a rope around his neck, dragging an anvil behind him. Right, okay. He said his neck was so strong that you could put him on a horse, put the noose around his neck, and he would dangle there for a minute with no ill effects. Wow. He was a showman, but he did it all because he grew up in Big Rock, Iowa, a town of about 50 people. And once again, Jesse hearkening back to the, he was the best wrestler in the village of 50, and then the surrounding area, and then became state champion, and then uh, considered a national champion. And he was uh, a wonderful strategist. Says he wrestled 6,000 matches in his lifetime and only lost six. And like you and I were saying earlier, who can verify any of that stuff? But very, very well respected, uh, a legendary figure. Opened up the Farmer Burns School of Wrestling in Omaha. I actually have all the, the original 12 part series of it. Very fascinating to look through and lived, devoted his whole life to wrestling. Just, I mean, he had a wife and, and kids, but wrestling was his whole life and his whole identity. And he coached a lot of great wrestlers. You, you had mentioned it's, it's hard to go back so far into the past and, and to understand or, or absorb this information adequately when we don't have the sources. You, you seem to have be uh, very definite in your opinions about this. So how do you try to judge objectively the, the qualities between these guys where we have very little to no film footage of them or their opponents to determine their quality over what we have today or against other people? Um, well, you always look at their record. Uh, Gotch won his last 88 matches without losing a single fall. Um, his last loss was to Fred Bill, and I can explain to you what happened there, but uh, that would be going off on a sidetrack we don't need to. Okay. He went five years without losing or even having a close match. And then you read what his contemporary said, Stanislaus Zabisco, in an interview in Sport Magazine when he was near the end of his life, and he'd been a world heavyweight champ, said Gotch was the best, no question about it. Mm -hmm. I've talked to Wally Provost, who was the sports editor of the Omaha paper for 50 years and knew Farmer Burns and Joe Stecker and Earl Caddick personally, said Gotch was the best. I've talked to, uh, I've read all kinds of things from pro wrestlers. Um, B, B, Dr. Roller, who was in Hackenschmidt's camp and disliked Gotch, mm. uh, said Gotch was the greatest catch wrestler of all time. So you just look at the sources. Nat Fleischer, the legendary editor and founder of Ring Magazine, ranked Gotch number one and Hackenschmidt number two, the greatest wrestlers of all time. Mm. And then here, here's something I found out about him that everybody said about him. He was a farm kid, so he was farm strong. Uh, he asked, also had what Jack Dempsey had. He was very personable outside the ring, but once he heard the ding of the bell, he became a different person. He was able to really turn it on and uh, be, be as mean as it took to win a match. But here's the defining thing when I heard. He weighed about 205, and every story I read about in newspaper account said he was lightning fast for a big man. So I think he had quickness, he had farm strength, he had the desire, he was extremely competitive, and he had a mean streak that he could call up, like a Mike Tyson or a Jack Dempsey or something like that. Yeah. And you need that, you need mm. that. So it's, it's just reading all these through the years, I just, I think he's the best there ever was. Okay. And so are we now at that point in time, my, my understanding or, or what I had started to read of catch is that you had such dominant champions that after a period of time, they couldn't draw the same crowds anymore because they already knew who was going to be the winner. And this is where we start seeing match fixing enter it of putting up the local guy just so they can come back next month and drop the belt to them and create this, 
drama yeah. ultimately, which which is the blueprint of professional wrestling that we see today. And and um, you know, you, you're you're from kind of the heartland of wrestling in in North America, but trying to have these conversations realistically with people who who don't follow any sort of martial arts, wrestling is no more than Hulk Hogan to them, and they don't see beyond that. So trying to explain the actual finesse and activity of the sport is is very hard to do. So when when does professional wrestling as we know it begin to you know drop its claws in, into i guess the sport that we're talking up to until this point well you gave me a great segue into why gotch was the best uh as you well stated the, the way you drum up interest is to make sure the competitor has some chance of victory gotch never gave anybody a chance of victory mm-hmm. he never lost a fall he never let so he never he might have carried people for maybe five or ten minutes but he was so prideful and so fierce and his reputation meant so much to him that he never gave anybody a break. And then I talked to you about the Caddox Stecker match and the Omaha newspaper reporter said it was boring. So all of a sudden you're in the roaring twenties. You've got Babe Ruth and a juiced up baseball. He hit more home runs in 1927 than the rest of the teams in the league combined. You've got <laughs> Red Grange running wild. You've got Jack Dempsey posting 18 first round knockouts mm. and the flamboyancy of the flapper era and prohibition and everything. People weren't going to pay to watch two guys lay on a mat for an hour and a half, one guy trying to get a hook on the other guy. Yeah. So all of a sudden, uh, the, the thing that really killed it was a match between the legendary Ed Starringer Lewis and Joe Stecker in Omaha. Jesse, they wrestled for five and a half hours. Mm. The crowd started out at 5,000. By the end of the, the match, there were only like 200 people left. Two referees They passed. left, huh? right? Uh, both of them had to go to the hospital afterwards, and the match ended in a draw. Now, who's going to pay to watch that? Mm. Maybe you and me and two or three other purists. But wrestling promoters realized we've got to put some excitement into this or we're out of business. So they went to the college ranks to get football stars, Gus Sonnenberg of Dartmouth and Wayne Big Mun of Nebraska. And they had no wrestling background, but they had name recognition. They were glamorous and they put them into title matches after a few setups. And all of a sudden now you got, there's a terrible video. I have it of the poor Joe Stecker in the thirties long past his prime he lost all of his money in the stock market he wanted to retire as a wealthy man he didn't get to and he's wrestling gus sonnenberg a college product who can't wrestle a lick and joe has to let him be in because sonnenberg is the champion and the big draw so that's what happened you had the work matches coming in and but you still so have this is the to, early 30s that we're talking about now roughly late 20s late 20s and then uh they were really starting to get um, set up matches by the end of the uh, uh, Gotch era. And then it really took off into the 20s and was in full flight by the 30s. And do we, um, is wrestling still divided into territories the way that, you know, it's talked about through the 60s and 70s by this point in time, where certain guys are controlling certain states and they're running their own well, titles? At this point in time, yes. Yeah, At okay. this point in time, yes, in the 30s and 40s. In fact, the first real coalition was the organization of the National Wrestling Alliance in uh, National Wrestling Association in 1947 in my hometown, Waterloo, Iowa. Okay. Where about eight promoters came together and decided to have a unified champion and to work together. And Lou Fez was their first unified champion. Well, I'm sure you're familiar with that name. Lou became my father figure. When I, when my wife and I started the International Wrestling Institute Museum in Newton, Iowa, he and his wife, Charlie, came from Norfolk, Virginia and stayed with us for three solid weeks designing. And 90% of the uh, museum is geared toward amateur wrestling. When you walk in the entry, we had a huge mural of Abraham Lincoln wrestling Jack Armstrong. You walk around the corner, we had a huge mural of Jacob wrestling the Angel of the Lord. And off in the far corner, we had a separate wing for the pros. And uh, now, can, we just, can we clarify this for a second? Because we're talking sure. pro wrestling. So pro wrestling, because uh, in, in any other sport, pro means financially compensated. So are we just talking about financial compensation? When you say pro, we are also implying fixed wrestling as well. They're one and the same in the okay. 30s, 40s, and 50s. Right. Yeah, everybody, the gorgeous George, the Argentina Rockas, the people, the show business people were the big draw. 
And Luthez became a big draw because he was a throwback to the days of Gotch. He came in the ring with a black robe, LT initials, and he did a little gimmicky. He'd do a drop kick now and then or uh, cock his fist or something like that. But he wanted to wrestle. Mm. And But he had to play the game. Yep. If you're going to do this, if you want to earn a living and stay in the, quote, sport slash business, you, I'm going to read to you what he told me. He wrote this in my house. Listen to this. Luthez wrote this. This is the guts of pro wrestling right here, Jesse. Words of Luthez. A great pro wrestler was never determined by the best two out of three falls. Greatness was determined by the fans. How many would pay to see him again? When I came into the business, we still had respect for each other based on two out of three fall. Today, no one capitalized. Promoters, fans, or so-called pro wrestlers knows or even cares. Mm. He got into the, he won his first world title in 1937. Whether or not he won it from Everett Marshall, who was a tough old boy. Even Lou wasn't sure if, if it was a folk, fake match at all. Because he said, I went out there to wrestle my best, and I ended up winning. Uh, I don't know if Everett turned the title over to me because of pressure, because he was old and wanted out, or if I beat him. Mm -hmm. I really couldn't tell. But after that, you know, he was champion, NWA champion, longer than any other wrestler ever. Over a total of 13 years, he wrestled 6,000 matches. And he was the Frank Gotch of his era. But he knew the goal wasn't who could beat who it was who fan pay to see you again. And that brings in your Andre, the giants and your gorgeous Georges and your Argentina rockers and all your showmen. So is there, is there a particular date? Like, are we saying by, by 1935 or by 1940, for example, it's all fixed. Now there's no legitimate wrestling anymore. We have to define the term all there have always been shoots but they're few and far between and they're involved with ego or somebody just getting mad or trying to prove a point, which I guess would go back to ego. Now shoot means um, a legitimate match. My, my understanding of this, uh, and this was fascinating to find out as well, is apparently the term comes from someone who shoots from the hip, which makes them a straight shooter, which means mm -hmm. it's legitimate, which I found fascinating as someone who doesn't really know much about pro wrestling. Yeah, that's where I think the term originated too. Like so much in wrestling, it's all murky and you mm -hmm. find different quote answers, but that was my understanding too. You're a straight shooter. It's a real shoot, a straight sh between two, two wrestlers who want to see who's the best. And Luthez had several shoots, people. And sometimes th the promoters wanted somebody in the carrier title who they knew could defend the title mm -hmm. because they had a lot at stake too. They didn't want some renegade coming in and taking the title. It happened in 1925 when Ed Strangler Lewis was the champion and he was tired and wanted to break from wrestling 300 nights a year. He told the, the trust, that's what that was called, the people that, that ran the pro wrestling, I need a break. I want to go to Europe and play gin rummy and hang out and then meet, meet a few ladies. So they talked him into turning the title over to Wayne Munn, a Nebraska football player who couldn't yeah. wrestle a lick. And Ed apparently said, I will never let him pin me or submit me. You come up with some other way. So they came up with Wayne Munn getting in a football stance, running into him and knocking him out of the ring eventually. And Ed couldn't get back in by the count of 20. So he lost the title that way. So here's Ed, uh, Wayne Munn, 6'5", 240, traveling around as the world heavyweight champion, drawing big crowds. And here's old Stanislaus Zabisco waiting on the outside saying, Here's my chance. I could never beat Ed Lewis. So he has a match with him and everybody thinks it's going to go fine. And when they shake hands, Stanislaus, much shorter, looks up at him and says, tonight we wrestle. <laughs> and Wayne Munn was terrified. And Stanislaus pinned him twice and embarrassed him and became world heavyweight champion. So the, the trust sent an emergency wire to Ed Lewis said, get home fast. The old man, the old pole just stole your title. <laughs> so Ed Lewis comes right back and chases Stanislaus all over trying to get a rematch or trying to get a match with him. So that's the last true big double cross in wrestling. Mm. 
but there's been others through the years I'm sure that I'm not aware of. I'm Canadian, so even I know what how Bret Hart was screwed over coming from Calgary, but that, that strays in much later down the time frame of, of professional wrestling. Okay, so so not, roughly 25 were into, sorry, what's the term that they used for, for fixed, again, we know a shoot is a legitimate match. What's, yeah. what's the term that they use for fixed fights? Well, uh, a setup or a prearranged. Pre, okay, I thought there was okay. another ter- another term, like the way that they use. Is it kayfabe? There's all these new industry terms associated with um, with wrestling. But so um, f- a, a predetermined outcome, fixed wrestling becomes dominant through 25. But, you know, again, even though that I'm not that old yet, it doesn't really seem like wrestling comes back to prominence again, probably until like the late 60s, early 70s, when it seems to start getting on regional television. So did it sort of drop off during that period because this is where we start um you know for a lot of people of you know really really big periods of boxing around like you know the the 30s and 40s does it does it effectively get usurped by other sports even as it tries to go the the fixed pro route i think so uh the first i remember watching wrestling in my home in waterloo iowa on a little flickering black and white set was 1955 i was 12 years old and we would get waterloo's about 300 miles from chicago and they had the Dumont Network and Vern Gagne. Is that a name you're familiar with? Yep. Vern Gagne? Vern Gagne was the big star in the Midwest. He had been a four-time uh, conference champion in college, two-time NCAA champion, 1948 Olympian. Really good looking, a straight wrestler. His big hold was the sleeper. And just a judo choke, as you know, a rear naked choke. Yep. And I would sit there with my family family and my grandmother who loved pro wrestling. Why do they let those men do those things? <laughs> oh, they he's hitting him. He's kicking him. Where's the referee? And my dad would say, now mother, it was his mother, my grandmother, uh, just calm down. But I've also re- read a commentary on the history of television saying that it was Milton Burrow, the great You're Canadian right. yeah. and pro wrestling that made television a sensation because think about it, pro wrestling, was involved theatrics and uh, athletics in a small confined area. You could shoot it with one camera. Mm. It wasn't like a football field or a baseball field running all around. Yep. I can remember going downtown on a Saturday night in Black's department store. They'd have five TV sets there in the windows to lure people in to buy TV sets. And they'd have pro wrestling on every one of them. And there'd be 50 people there looking in the window, watching the pro wrestling matches. Yeah, right. So, and gorgeous George hit the scene in the late forties and he yep. was a phenomena and he wasn't a bad wrestler. His name was George Wagner. And do you know how he got started? I do. Know. He was, he was opening card getting $10 a night. He had a butch haircut and was soft looking and he'd get $10 for an opening match. Well, he disappeared from pro wrestling and didn't want to do it anymore. And Gene LaBelle's mother called him up and said, we need an opening act. Can you come? He'd been out Even of wrestling. Even LaBelle's family comes from professional wrestling, do they? Absolutely. That's very interesting. Yeah, right. Okay. Because yeah. because we, we know him as Judo Gene LaBelle. Yeah. And he was a legitimate Judo champion mm. and a very tough guy. Good friend of mine. I get Christmas cards from him every year. Yeah, right. And, okay. And, and Gene's mother got a hold of uh, George Wagner and he said, hey, I've been living on the beach. I'm all tan. I've got long blonde hair and I ain't going to cut it. And she says, that's okay. Just come on in. So he comes in and he's walking down for the opening card and he's kind of strutting and people start booing him. Hey, what are you pretty boy? Fancy boy. And that becomes it. Hey. Yeah. And he has fun with him. He kind of yells back and forth and he wins the match and he thinks that's it. They're mobbed, the front office, bring this guy back. The fans hate, love to hate him. <laughs> so he starts coming back, and pretty soon he's a main eventer. He's on TV. Bob Hope goes to his matches. Roy Rogers, the Cowboy star, goes to his matches. Gorgeous George is the hot. He's the Hulk Hogan of his era. He's so he's the revivalist. He, he's the guy that kind of brings it back. Yeah. All right. Okay. And Thez, Thez loved working with him. He said, there's two reasons I liked working with him. You knew you were going to have a fat payday. And George could actually wrestle a little bit and you'd get in there and it wouldn't be all punching and shouting and yelling and you could do some stuff. Okay. Uh, and so gorgeous George was a big, big phenomena. So 
so now I think now's kind of the time that we start talking about Billy Robinson because Billy Robinson in modern day catch seems to be the originator who was, who was kind of the last of the lineage who began teaching the people who are now the operators of this sport. So we, we've got fixed or predetermined wrestling that goes out that way. Where and when does Billy Robinson pop into this? How does he fit into this? Because he's the one that's doing you know legitimate submissions, not associated, or I guess he was a pro wrestler as well, but he sort of kind of brings it back to its, its foundations or how, how does this work and why, why is he the name associated with catch wrestling today? Good question. And I got to know Billy fairly well. Uh, once again, back to Vern Gagne. Vern Gagne is the AWA. He starts his own American Wrestling Association, and he's the world heavyweight champion. And he brings Billy over into Minneapolis to use him because he likes the fact that he, Vern always went after real wrestlers. He liked that. He liked to have them in his stable. And Billy, so I'm sports editor in Fort Collins, Colorado, right north of Denver. And Vern Gagne and Billy Robinson are in the card in Denver. 8,000 people sell. Vern's the headliner against Baron Von Rasky. Have you ever heard that name? No. An incredible villain, uh, Baron Von Rasky. And Billy's in the semi-main event. And afterwards, I go out to dinner with Billy Robinson and Vern Gagne. And we're sitting in this really plush place. And one of my friends is, a, is with me, Jim Dushin three-time Greco-Roman national champ at 220, world team, very well built. And we're sitting there talking. And right in the restaurant, Jim asked Vern about maybe wrestling pro. And Vern says, you'd be a natural, blah, blah, blah. And Jim says something about how much of it is real and how much of it is phony. And Billy Robinson says, let me show you. And right in the restaurant with nice people around, he gets up and he grabs Jim and he puts a front face lock on him. I mean, Jim lets him get in the maneuver yeah. and he cranks it. And Jim's hopping up and down in pain and Billy's cranking him in this restaurant in, uh, in Denver, Colorado. And Vern's just sitting there eating shrimp, and drinking beer, watching him. And Billy Robinson sits down and he says, there's two types of pro wrestling. There's the money type where you go in and put on a show to make money. And there's a type where you go in to show the other guy who's boss. So he came over here to make money, Jesse, so he could continue to do what he loves, which is wrestle. Most of the pros were scared of him. Uh, Vern had a tough time getting in matches and like that, unless Billy would take it. And the great Dan Hodge. Hodge was feared by everybody and as a great hooker and submission wrestler. And I could sit here and tell you two hours of Dan Hodge stories. I shoot with Bruiser Brody and other people. And, uh, but if they want to continue to wrestle pro and make money doing what they love, they had to learn how to do, uh, go along with the game. Billy Robinson's period is, is around the sixties. Do I have that roughly correct? Yes. 60s and in, in early, let's see, the time I'm telling you about in Denver was 1976. So, so what, came over in the 60s and was doing it till about the late 70s. What happens during that time? Well, there, there's, there's a few things evolving here, first of all, because now we start talking about, you know, and, and we've seen all the clips where, where wrestling is perceived as fake. So there seems to be a lot of people trying to bully people to show them it's real, which goes against what you had said earlier about wrestling being the gentleman sport it really seems to change <laughs> in that respect where the fact that they're not acknowledged for being at, at least athletic seems to really piss a lot of them off where they have to hurt people to demonstrate that it can be utilized realistically but in addition to that you know um how does billy robinson become the revivalist of the sport because it, as i said growing up in calgary and I understand that it's professional wrestling, but we had Stu Hart and Stampede Wrestling. And Stu Hart's place was known to be, you know, one of the main... The dungeon. The dungeon is what it was called. And he was known for hurting people as part of introduction to the, the training of, of getting into wrestling. But that seems to, again, have skewed towards pro wrestling, where Billy Robinson seems to have become this, the modern-day revivalist um, godfather or sensei of legitimate submission wrestling you know the name jake shannon yes and and i'm sure we can talk about scientific wrestling and as i said I've, i'm now associated with joel bain and um snake pit usa yeah. um so there's probably a few ways that we can move that conversation but he is he the one that kind of reaches out to him initially 
Yeah, and and I don't know Jake well, um, but I do know uh, that he, I think he is the one who, who really looked up to Billy Robinson, knew he had a background in Wigan, and one and brought him into the fold and did a lot to market him as the guru, the living legend, I think, of catch wrestling, mm. which is fine. I mean. It, 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 Billy had hit on hard times and Billy needed, Billy needed something like this. When we inducted him into the pro wrestling hall of fame in Newton, he, uh, his daughter called me up and said, you don't know how much that means to Billy to be inducted into a real wrestling museum hall of fame. He's lost 30 pounds. So he looks All more right. presentable. And, uh, Billy was just a really nice guy. And, uh, but he was very proud of his Wigan heritage. And he was eager to show that to people and pass it on. And Jake, to his credit, uh, saw an opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And he became his, quote, godfather of catch wrestling. So it was a, a relationship, I think, that uh, they both profited from. Do you feel that there are any other sort of teachers then from that area? Because this, as a way a lot of martial arts or sports goes, there's still a lot of inherent marketing in it. And one style becomes best because they simply know how to sell it better. So is there, were there other, a, a generation of similar wrestlers from that, that period that, that you think deserve credence or who created their own style out of that as well? Well, I, I, are you familiar with the name Dan Hodge, who I've referred to a couple of times? No, but you, only, only from what you've mentioned during our conversation so far today. Undefeated three-time NCAA champion, silver medalist in the Olympics, got screwed out of the gold medal by a Russian referee in a match in Australia, by the way, oh. in Melbourne, a whole <laughs> other story. And then became the only person in American history to win national titles in boxing and wrestling, national Golden Gloves champion, can take his hands and crack a pair of pliers is well known if you go on his website, Dan Hodge, he takes an apple, a solid apple, and just crushes it. Okay. Uh, a legendary figure that Pete, when he grabs you and goes up your arm, you, he leaves black and blue spots. Uh, Dan could have been uh, marketed in that respect, but Dan's a very private person, married his high school sweetheart, uh, still lives in his hometown of Perry, Oklahoma. And I always thought I marketed him the biggest trophy in amateur wrestling is called the Dan Hodge trophy. Mm. It goes to the top college wrestling in the United States. And I created that 25 years ago. Um, I used to go around to big college tournaments and Dan would go with me as my guest and he would show catch moves and holds to people. Uh, but as we talked about earlier, it's all marketing. Everything's marketing. Uh, Gorgeous George is a great example of that. And uh, I, I don't know, other than to say Jake Shannon deserves a lot of credit for uh, building this mystique around Billy Robinson. And well, do, deserved mystique. And do we know much because um, like I, I'm very, very partial to uh, Pride FC and, the, and the, the old Japanese MMA organization, which created guys like Kazushi Sakuraba and, and Josh Barnett was a part of there. Um, Billy Robinson has said on video, he takes credit for teaching those guys do we know if he was actually heavily in, in, involved was he spending a lot of time in japan because that would have been new japan pro wrestling and and nobuhika takata i think if if that was the gym that it would have come through i, I can't answer that i don't know the answer to that i know he's been to japan luthez has been there dozens of times they call him the eternal champion and my friend brad ryan gets eight time national champion two olympic teams wrestled the 14 years as uh in the awa has made 82 trips to Japan. Mm. He's the guy who trained uh, Brock Lesnar and some other people. Um, but but I don't know that much background on Billy. I really don't, Jesse. Sorry. Okay. Um, I, I want to ask about the, the the amateur state of it. So when scholastic wrestling divides into its own thing, how, how long has uh, well, we've got three forms of it? Then it, it said we've got we've got freestyle, Greco-Roman. And we've also got um, folk style, which is a slight okay. variation on freestyle, which I believe has more ground-based work slightly. Do, do you want to just kind of explain those and when they came to prominence as part of the, you know, the education system and, and an amateur sport? Well, Nat Fleischer in his great book called From Milo to Lundos, talking about the entire history of wrestling, says it was the popularity of Frank Gotch and his widespread publicity that caused colleges to take up wrestling. The first college wrestling meet we know of was between Yale and Columbia University in 1903. 
Okay. Um, and then it began to evolve. And of course, the Iowa schools picked it up really quickly uh, because of Frank Gotch and Farmer Burns. They were Iowans and right. they got so much publicity and it made it popular. And the first state high school tournament that I'm aware of, I think, was held in Iowa in 1921. And the first collegiate national tournament was held in Ames, Iowa in 1928. As I told you earlier, the first AAU national tournament was held in 1888. And it began to evolve and move into the Midwest because of the type of people I told you about earlier that settled the Midwest who liked solitary, combative type sports. So um, Scholastic, Scott, it wasn't going to go into the colleges and into the high schools if there was any safety issues. Mm. If there was any chance somebody was going to get hurt, or no school was going to pick it up. So that's when they brought in rules where the pin was paramount, just turning a guy. Uh, no holds across the neck. You could do a cross face across the, the chin and even up into the nose a little bit but they were terrified of cauliflower ears and things like that. So there were all these safety rules put in. So scholastic wrestling really evolved more toward mat wrestling. Control okay. just worked for the pin. Freestyle basically was still stayed on your feet, uh, that that was the emphasis. And then Greco just kind of disappeared because right. or it fell into the shadows because it was too limited. Americans okay. have a more wide open style of more frontier style. So it just, it just, things just morphed into these three different styles. And, and so folk style is only high school out there typically, and then it becomes and college. free and, and college. college as well. But freestyle is in college or just universities? Or uh, freestyle is uh, after school. Uh, no, there's no freestyle in high school or college. Now, some of the college or high school and college wrestlers wrestle freestyle in the summer. When they're not, uh, the that's only Olympic then Olympic is Greco and freestyle. So this is where yeah. they, they get their base of folk style from high school and college and then decide to go Olympic and, yes. and sp yeah. skew into one of those two. And, okay. and there's a scoring distance difference too. Uh, you have to be aware of the scoring differences and, and different rules and modifications and time links. Now, uh, in 50, 1952, a good friend of mine, Bill Smith was Olympic champ in 1952 since passed on. And the matches were 15 minutes. Mm. Now they're six minutes. Yeah, that really reduces the um, the effort on on endurance training, but puts a greater emphasis on scoring and scoring fast. I think and that's a good thing, though, not a bad thing. It. Yeah, yeah. But I'm a mat wrestler. I I, I like mat wrestling. There's a movement now. Some people want to take uh, mat wrestling out of school wrestling. Uh, and bend it more toward the Olympic style. And uh, I'm against that. I think wrestling, if you're going to be a wrestler, you need to how, to, how to control people too, not just take them down. Mm. I think you would agree with that being a BJJ black belt. Well, the, there's a lot of information too about, um, you know, when they talk, of the, a, a lot of guys who wrestled think that folk style is the best transitional form into MMA. And you can see that, I think, through guys like uh, Chael Sonnen and Ben Askren because it it honors the control on the ground it's not just about getting sure. to the ground and finishing it's about being able to and what restrain was someone knock? and what was the big knock against ben askren who i know well and greatly admire you're boring man you just hey, oh yeah that's yeah. Oh. yeah and what did ben used to say find somebody that can that can beat me uh and i'll agree but well, the they goal did is to win and win mm. And, and what Ben was 18 and 0 before he finally got his two losses, one by a flying knee. Mm. Uh, he did but, very well over in one, but before the, the trade with um, he sure did. Johnson's. Yeah. So, um, so have you followed up? I think before we did this interview, you said, look, I, I don't follow too much of the modern pro wrestling and stuff. Did, do you still follow or did you follow any of that? Do you have an interest in MMA these days? I was very interested in the early days of MMA because I was friends with Dan Severn, Randy Couture, knew Dan Henderson. Uh, we weren't what you would call friends, but re greatly respected him. Uh, Kevin Randleman, uh, uh, actually, no Mark, Hall, Mark Hall, and I knew all these guys from college wrestling, and I I wanted to see wrestling get the respect of other martial artists. Oh, it certainly did. It's the dominant yeah, it, form it, in the sport. And I think Severn was a huge factor in that. Remember those great mm -hmm. backs of plays he'd do and, and what a fierce competitor he was. And uh, 
And uh, he's such I, a nice guy. It's hard for you, if people that know him and get around him, it's hard to believe that he was a UFC heavyweight world champion. Well, I think the biggest change is when, again, one of my all-time favorite guys and a friend of Dan was when, when I think it was Severn who actually got Don Fry involved in the sport. Oh. And you mentioned guys like Dan Hodge and, and uh, Fry was the first guy to have both the combination of boxing and wrestling where he wasn't limited to the one discipline. And then, of course, after you get him, you get Mark Coleman, who brought in this uh, a whole new era, which was, I might not have the box, but I can hurt him when you're on the ground. Now, yeah. I never knew Don Fry, but I have great respect for him. Uh, you're right. He's, he's, a, he's a one tough hombre. And I did know Mark Coleman fairly well from college wrestling. And you're right. He, he brought a whole new style. But yeah. shortly after that, Jesse, I don't know, um, my life evolved and... I developed other interests, and once I didn't know the, the people personally, um, I, I sort of quit following it. So yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you well, know, I'm 77 years old. Uh, I've had a lot of health issues. I've had uh, two heart procedures. I've had my neck cut wide open. My throat moved aside. A titanium plate put in my neck, and uh, I've got three kids and seven grandkids. Uh, one of whom is sitting over here right now. <laughs> And uh, that's my focus. And but but Jesse and I, you know, to kind of wrap this up, um, I love the history of the sport, and I want people like Frank Gotch and Dan Hodge and Lou Thez to be remembered, Earl Caddock and Joe Stecker, and so that's been my mission, Jesse, to keep these names alive, and to let people know that this sport has a tradition that goes back six thousand years. What's basketball's tradition go back 150 years, baseball, soccer, golf, all great sports, but wrestling stands alone. I say it's a thread that helps pull all of human societies together. And I love it for that reason. And as I alluded to uh, when we first began, uh, the self-defense portion of it. Well, we'll have to have you come back at some point and, and dip into Dan Gable and Alex Carolyn and a whole bunch of other characters. I would love to. Sport. I don't know if you've ever seen, but I've produced uh, 20 posters and one of them was my most successful poster is Train Like a Madman, Alexander Carellin. Have you ever seen it? I don't think I've seen the poster, but um, I've certainly seen his gut wrenches. <laughs> and yeah, well, that's, that's a terrifying man. And he's grimacing and he's looking into the, his face is all uh, knotted up. And it's a quote I took off ABC. He says, people ask me if I've ever taken steroids. The only thing I've ever done is train like a madman. I wish people who'd accuse me would train every once a in their life like I train every day of my life. And I called him up in the Soviet Union. It took me two months to get a hold of him uh, through all kinds of channels. And I actually got him on the phone and said, do I have your permission, Alexander, to use this picture of you? And uh, by the way, he's a fan of George Hackenschmidt. Can he speak and, English? Uh, yes. Broken English. Okay. Yeah. Broken English. And uh, he said, uh, in fact, I had a Russian interpreter with me who originally talked to him and broke the ice. Okay. And then um, I spoke to him briefly and he said, yes, I appreciate what you are doing for wrestling. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've sold a ton of those posters and I'm going to send you one. If you'll email me your address. You I'm and gonna, I are going to have a chat about picking up some of this library that you have. I, I'm sure there's another chat to have there. And and Carolyn leads into another very interesting story about Rulon Gardner, another guy who ended up fighting in Japan over in MMA. There's Rulon and I were inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame at the same time. And I have a great picture of him putting a headlock on me. Mm. And you know what? I asked him at that induction, when did you first know about Alexander Carellin? He said, I saw this great poster when I was at Nebraska called Train Like a Madman. I created that poster. And Jesse, I have in my den where I do all my writing, Frank Gotch's favorite lounge chair that he sat in all the years that he lived in Humboldt, his white wicker desk. I own his derby hat. There's a famous picture of him standing with Jim Jeffries, the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. They were good friends, and Gotch is wearing that derby hat, and I own it. Yeah. And I have the letter of authenticity from his widow. I also own the wrestling shoes that Joe Stecker wore most of his career. 
At one point, I had Joe Stecker's wall pulleys. I took them right off the wall in an old gymnasium on the second floor in an abandoned building in Dodge, Nebraska. And so that's been my mission, Jesse. And I appreciate coming on your show to be able to talk about the history of wrestling that goes back to Gilgamesh and Jacob and Achilles and Abraham Lincoln. And my all-time number one hero in all sports is Frank Gotch, as you may have surmised. I did. And, and my guy is Coach Chur, who we've not even had a chance to, to bandy on about today, but perhaps that's for, uh, for another, another time. We'll do a follow-up. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. As I said, look, we will speak for a few more minutes. We, we'll sign off from everybody. But look, it, it's I'm very appreciative of your time today. And as I said, this is... Uh, as you can see, there's there's little bits of knowledge of wrestling that I know, but I, I haven't had the time to or the understanding to get sort of a definitive timeline and how this goes through. So I appreciate you um, taking the time to explain that to me because it gives me a hell of a lot of a better base of understanding when wrestling was real and when it's been off to become fixed and collegiate and how it's all sort of come back. And, and, and I think a lot of people uh, suffer the same problem that I have in sort of understanding the time frames of this. Can I, uh, I, I agree. And I, I think wrestling people who really care need to know the history. One of my best selling books was called the toughest men in sports. And it has Muhammad Ali, Dan Gable and Bruce Lee on the cover. And it has full chapters on Frank Gotch, Dan Hodge and Dan Gable, even has a picture of God, uh, Hodge crushing an apple. People can go on my website, uh, www.mike-chapman and see all my books fantastic if they, if they want to hear, learn more about the history of the sport jesse as i said we'll look to have you on again and thanks very much for your time today mike i've enjoyed it you do a good job thank you cheers this episode is brought to you by romulus it offering fast affordable remote support for common computer problems including troubleshooting health checks virus removal and software support Visit RomulusIT.com to get your computer back on track.